Okay. All right, hi everybody, this is Drew at Drew Supports Idiocracy. I have some friends here with me. We're going to do something different for a change. Um, I know I've talked about my sobriety, but I wanted to give a chance for my friends to also talk about theirs. So I may come up with some questions and we are going to go around and answer them each. Um, so hopefully this isn't totally boring for you who are not addicts, but anyways, um, let's see, here we go. Uh, the first question, what is your sober date? Yeah, go first. I was gonna say, who's going first? <laughs> you can go first every time, Kelsey. We'll do Kelsey Adam me. Okay, mine is May 6, 2020. Okay. Uh, mine is May 17th, 2020. And mine is May 24th, 2020. Um, let's see. Um, when did you start using or drinking? Um, drinking, probably my freshman year of high school. Um, I started smoking weed probably when I was like, 16 and then I got into like harder drugs when I was about 22 and I'm 24 now so um, quit while you're ahead <laughs> right <laughs> all right I'll see so I started smoking weed when I was 14 and then I started smoking a lot more and started drinking like literally the week I got my driver's license when I was 16 and Around that same time, I started getting into like mushrooms, did cocaine a few times, and then the age of 18 is when I started getting into a lot of other shit, and my drug use and alcohol use got real heavy after that. Gotcha. Um, for me, I started drinking when I was 15. Um, I had I was in the middle of my freshman year of high school, so I guess it's the, the same as Kelsey, which, oh, by the way, I didn't introduce everybody. I know it says our names, but... Everyone, this is Kelsey. Say hi, Kelsey. Hi. Adam. Uh, this, is, this is who I spent the fourth with, and I called him Hot Adam in my rehab video. <laughs> um, and anyways, all right. Uh, for me, I started drinking when I was 15, and I started smoking weed when I was 16. And no, I was 17. I was 17. It wasn't until my junior year of high school. No, but I was still 16 at that time. Never mind. I was 16. It was just my junior year of high school. Um, and then I started doing meth when I was 19. And I fell into a bevy of other drugs after that, but they were pretty much all stimulants. So, I mean, it's, it's not anything super crazy. Like, I mean, it's just cocaine, ecstasy, stuff like that. I fell into that after I turned 21. All right. Next question. Well, this is going to be, I mean, I know both of your answers, but the world wants to know these answers. How many times have you been to treatment? One. Keep it that way. <laughs> uh, same for me. Just, this is my first time. All right. And I'm going to seem like the hardened <laughs> addict who's like, I've been to treatment four times and you ain't seen shit that you see <laughs> what I see. But yeah. <laughs> been through the NOM of treatment? I've, I've been, what's that? You've been through the NOM of through treatment. Through the NOM of treatment, yes, I have. I've, I've seen shit. All right, let's see, was there when I put for fourth? Because I wrote these kind of out of order, and so I put first, second, third, I think, I, oh, there's fourth. What is, well, we already, I guess we, no. Like, what's your specific substance of choice? Okay, um, I kind of had a few. The main one was cocaine, um, and then ecstasy and molly. Okay. Uh, for me, it, alcohol and weed were always like a pretty constant substance for me. And then you got into pain pills and meth. Meth was a good like two year run, and then I did pain pills and Xanax bars, and I think that was like Tic Tacs for a good like five years. And then the last two years, uh, I took a job where I had to take drug tests to get away from all the other drugs and just substituted the amount I was using those for alcohol. And my alcohol use got really, really heavy. So recently it's been alcohol. Okay. And mine, um, as everyone is aware, are meth and alcohol. Um, there's been lots of things in there. Like I did develop a good cocaine habit for a while um, in my early 20s, but 
it was like, as I was doing it, I was like, I wish this was math. <laughs> Like, I feel up, but I could be more up with, like, less money. So, you know, you have to be economical when you're spending money on drugs. <laughs> All right. Now we're just going to go to the top. What was life like for you before you sought treatments? Chaotic as fuck, man. It was like I was up for weeks at a time, just constantly running on nothing. Like, I wasn't eating. I wasn't sleeping. Just looking for more. I guess you could say really like that was my drug of choice was more like yeah. I just wanted more 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 and it was all about me all about me everything that you did that caused me problems <laughs> it was never my fault yeah you know? so yeah it was just chaotic and all about me and what you could do for me and what you did that caused my problems okay Adam uh I mean I, kinda, I think it's pretty much I think everybody has a lot of similarities in that regard but yeah, it was very chaotic and it was just like a miserable existence mm -hmm. I had basically like right before treatment I basically alienated everyone in my life nobody wanted anything to do with me my wife was considering leaving me I had like little to no relationship with her and couldn't hardly take care of my kids I just hated waking up and living with myself every day it was just miserable. It's a miserable existence. Okay. Um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go with what it was like before my first treatments, because that's when I was like really in the madness. Like anything in the last six years has just been, I mean, I was in the madness for sure, but it was, it was different once I had that first treatment. But like before I sought to better myself, I, um, I don't whine a lot. Like, my hope when I whenever I came clean about my drug habit, like everyone was shocked. Like my friends didn't know, my parents didn't know, my siblings didn't know. You know, I you know, my parents knew I had used at least one time because I came home with needle marks in my arms. And I couldn't hide those. Um, but it was just a lot of lying and self-indulgence and like Kelsey said, thinking about me, me, me. It was what can I do to get what I want, to get you to do what I want too? I mean, like, what can I, how can I get what I want and what can I do to manipulate any situation to suit me and my needs? And I was very selfish. I did a lot of selfish things in act, like at times when I was actually using and even whenever I wasn't using, I was like that. It, was, it, it didn't matter if there was a drug or, or um, alcohol in my system. I was like that all the time and also i was an escort at that time too so i mean like this, the need for secrecy uh, for me was very high can i backtrack a little bit yeah go, go for yeah, it to take more on that just add on to that like selfishness was a really big part of what life was like before that for treatment um like uh, the manipulation was a pretty big aspect of my addiction for a long time then the last uh, like this last run was like the line the manipulation was just out the window because like everybody knew my wife is we got to the point now where she always knows when i'm using a drinking alcohol is kind of hard to hide as well the smell and be a drunk use act stupid it's kind of hard to hide that but like, i just stopped caring like my selfishness got to a point where i did not care how it affected anyone in my life i did not think about anyone but myself didn't think about anything but drinking and it, like, my selfishness had reached a point where i didn't even know it was possible. I had my three kids, my wife just became like non-existent. They weren't even a worry or a care in my mind. I was just constantly worrying about how I could get fucked up and when I was going to be able to do it. Yeah. There you go. All right. How has your family reacted uh, to you after leaving treatments? That's funny. I was actually just talking about that earlier. Um, so as of right now, it's kind of like my family and my coworkers, they all just kind of tiptoe around me and like act as if I'm like this gentle little flower that's going to like break if they say something wrong or yeah. do something wrong. And it's just like, I'm still a normal person. We can still have normal conversations and you all can still drink or do whatever you want, you know, just of course, keep the drinking and everything away from me or like, let me know if you're going to be doing it. But like, I am not a different person, you know? I mean, I am, but I'm not. But it's like, you can still talk to me like 
I am your daughter, okay? Yeah. You know <laughs> but you it's just like they, they act like they need to like sugarcoat things now. And it, it gets a little aggravating, but I get where they're coming from. So I understand, but at the same time, it's also just frustrating. <laughs> Here you go. Uh, for me, what was the question? How my family is treating me? How has your family reacted up to you after leaving treatment? Um, well, like my home life has been really good. Like my kids are really glad to have me back home. I uh, feel like my relationship with my wife has been a lot better since I've been home. I feel like I've actually been able to be emotionally available and actually, man, I stay awake and stay sober at nighttime. So it's a little easier to have conversations when you're sober and awake, not passed out drunk. Yeah. You know? uh, she sent me a text message today and just like giving me like a word of encouragement, let me know how much of a difference she's seen and. Uh, yeah, I've been doing a lot better and she can see the uh, prayer and going to meetings and like the work I've been putting in has been making a difference. Uh, as far as like the rest of my family, my mom, I honestly don't really know. I've only seen her twice since I've been gone. Wow. So we don't have like a really fantastic relationship to begin with. We're not very close. We've kind of grown apart like through the years of me, and my addiction. And I think part of that, I don't think that's all me. I think part of that is also her. Like the two times I have seen her, she wants to know like very little. She just talks about herself constantly the whole time. So I don't really know how to answer that question in that regard. Okay. But like my coworkers, it has been very strange. Kind of like what Kelsey was saying, like everybody has been treating me like very fragilely. Like they don't want to say the wrong thing. And uh, it's just been like really awkward. Yeah. I hear you. Um, I'm going to answer this question based upon this last time. That I, that I was in treatment instead of going through all four because every time out of treatment was something completely different and uh, it'll be too much to go into if I like go into every single one. So after this last time of treatment, my parents became actually supportive of me getting out of their house and not in like a, we're kicking you out, but more like you need to leave and we're going to help you. Because before I want, before treatment, I wanted to move out and go to, go to Louisville. Um, and they were very like you have to be able to pay for the whole thing yourself and you need to have a good job first like all this stuff and i couldn't get a job to save my life and so after this last time especially given my suicide attempt they just realized that we're bad for each other and um they, they just want to help me get a leg up on hopefully being able to stay sober because i've lived with them since my first time in treatment and they haven't been very supportive they've been supportive in the way of saying go to a meeting so, excuse me. So this time they have really stepped up and are actually being good parents for the first time since I came out of the closet. So, all right, what's next? Um, what is life like now after treatment? Um, it's pretty great, I think. I'm in a sober living house, so all of the ladies here are super awesome. Um, I never knew that you could have fun sober. That was one thing that like scared me. And I have had so much fun sober and like doing things that I never thought I could do sober and like sober laughter and sober conversations and actually being able to remember the night and like the things that I did, like my first 4th of July celebration and not being, you know, drunk or high or fucked up or whatever. And it's just like, amazing and like I can remember all of it and yeah. it's just I don't know I just love the fact that like I don't have to have the mind or mood altering substances to just have fun and meet people and talk to people so it's pretty great uh, for me it's been really good like I didn't realize like how unsociable I was whenever I was using I just wanted to like hide away from everybody like keep my using hidden from everyone but like at the same time like in social aspects, that was how it was, but like just like day to day stuff, I just like tried to stay fucked up constantly. So I was just like avoiding the monotony of everyday life, I guess. But like actually coming home and being sober, I've been able to realize that I'm capable of being happy and just enjoying being at work. You can still have fun being at work, having conversations, listening to music and singing while you're working. Uh, like my home life has been completely different, been able to actually like play with my kids and be available for them instead of pass out on the couch and then trying to poke me and get me to wake up, being able to actually just like enjoy the things that actually bring me real joy and happiness in my life. Yeah. 
uh, it's been really good. Good. All right, and Kelsey, I have a question real quick. This is completely unrelated. Did mm -hmm. you dye your hair again? Yes, I did. <laughs> and then she was looking at you, something purple? different about her. Something is really different. And I was like, I you can tell. This light's like hard to see, but it's like bright purple. Oh, it is? <laughs> yeah. Really like I'll send you a picture later. <laughs> yeah, that, yeah, put it in the group chat, which we need to add Adam to the group chat. Okay, I, yeah, we can. Okay. Um, it's There's only four of us in there right now, so it's yeah. not it's not out of control. <laughs> It's, it's, it's not like the Facebook Messenger one with like forty people in it. Yeah, well, this no, 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 no. Yeah, they're all. They're, you'll you'll make five. All right, and I haven't asked answered the question yet. And I forgot which one it was. What's life like? Been like since you've been out of treatment? Now, like, yeah. Um, no, it's it's better. My parents don't harp on me so much. Um, I think some of that is the. Them wanting to walk on eggshells around me, I think, because um, they know how unhappy they make me. And I think they realize that they make me really unhappy. Um, and so it's just, it's been like relaxing, like to not be in the madness anymore, to feel like I'm working towards something positive, which I haven't done that in a long time. I mean, the, but I forgot a treatment last time. I I was doing that until I relapsed, and then once I relapsed, I was just I was done for. I couldn't pull myself out of it. But um, let's see. Um, but yeah, life is good. I'm moving to Louisville to get away from my parents, and I'm gonna have a good sober support network there, and um, just looking up and looking forward and upwards. And um, I mean, I'm still living in today for anybody who's in the program, but um, I'm really excited to start this new chapter of my life. Okay, next question. What struggles, if any, do you see in your way of staying sober? Um, for me, I think it's just, I find myself missing my old group of friends Mm -hmm. And those are the friends that, like, I used with. And I've been staying away from them. Like, I mean, we still keep in contact through, like, Snapchat and stuff. Well, I, I say we, just me and one other friend. But, like, I don't know. I miss them. But then again, it's, like, it's not worth my, like, risking my sobriety. So I know not to, like, go around them. Yeah. But then again, you know, you get those memories that are, like, they seem like they were good. But then again, I was fucked up the whole time. So it's, like... Were they really that good? Yeah. But other than that, I don't really think there's anything else. <laughs> okay. Adam? Um, for me, I guess it would probably be myself more than anything. I feel like kind of getting in a slump, getting out of AA, not praying anymore, not staying like aware and alert of my thoughts and what's going on in my head. Just like getting in places, I guess, would be good. Yeah. Really feeling good, getting out of the habits that have been making me feel the way I do right now. Yeah, getting away from all that, just slipping back into the way I used to feel and maybe want to use. What's that sound? I a a plane. Okay, so I thought it sounded like a plane. So <laughs> at our meeting tonight, oh my, I, god. oh my god, that was so annoying. Like yeah, well, we every like, every ten minute, five to ten minutes, there'd be a plane go over, and some people would stop talking. Because this is not like, and people would just be like, they talk right through it. And I was like, cool, I totally missed like everything that you said. Well, we were like five minutes from an Air Force base <laughs> by like, so there was like constant military planes just flying overhead. Yeah. yeah, UPS is like right over there somewhere. So they're going out constantly. Gotcha. Okay. Yeah, whenever I didn't realize UPS had such a big hub there. Humongous. It's hum like when I took off from the airport and I, when I was leaving treatment. I was like, holy crap, like it was just a huge area. Yeah. This is up for you. Yeah, I guess. Places like that are always hiring. Better better pay the bills though. <laughs> pay them bills. I can't I can't turn back to hooking. I don't have the body for it. <laughs> All right. <laughs> um for me, sorry, struggles. Um I keep on I, I keep on almost forgetting to answer the questions myself. Um I 
I guess and kind of like Adam, it would be me doing something to get in my own way, like um, putting things before my sobriety, um, taking my will away from my higher power, um, doing anything that's that you're not supposed to do. And um, I don't know about either of you, but like, it's hard for me to um, take suggestions that I don't want to do and follow through with them. Yeah. Like praying was a big one for me. I, it took me forever to learn how to pray and be okay with praying. And a lot of it had to do with finally coming, like discovering a higher power that worked for me. But it just, I felt silly. Like, I was like, I'm not praying to anything. Like, so why pray? Um, so just, I think if I, if I don't take suggestions given to me, um, that could be something that would be a struggle that could cause struggles. Okay. Well, this is a juicy question. What dangerous or potentially dangerous things have you done due to your addiction? Oh, Lord. <laughs> if there's too no. many, just, just pick like the top one. Um... I don't even know, honestly. I mean, I guess really the worst thing was, I mean, I've slept with a few, quite a few people for drugs, mm -hmm. if we're being honest, you know? Yeah. So that'd probably be, you know, top, top one. <laughs> okay. Uh, see, for me, it would probably be, the top two would probably be driving under the influence. Mm -hmm. That's something I've done pretty consistently for about 10 years. And surprisingly, it's only resulted in two DUIs. But especially with my drinking, I feel like that impaired my driving more than anything. But like before both the DUIs I had, it was like a solid year of driving while drinking like 24 seven, just round the clock drinking and then driving to lunch at work, driving home, leaving the house late at night, go to Taco Bell, you name it. it was driving around constantly drunk and drinking while driving, not just driving drunk, like having a bottle under the seat and continuing to drink while driving. And mm -hmm. I mean, the second one would probably be my health, like the extent that my drinking got to. Like my wife looked it up a couple of times. She has a breathalyzer here in the house. And if you look at my height, my body weight, what I was, my blood alcohol content and what it was, was saying that I should have been hospitalized, but I just like built my tolerance up to the point where yeah. I could still like have memory and be somewhat functional at that point. Yeah. So drinking like that day after day is probably not good for you. As, did, were you in either of you in the group where they talked about um, uh, the highest blood alcohol cons or the highest BAC levels recorded? Mm -mm. Um, was, they, they did it. I, I forget who was leading the group. I think it, it might've been Caitlin. Um, but uh, no, it was LT, it was LT. Cause I remember, yeah, I remember her saying stuff now. But uh, the highest BAC ever recorded was 1.48 or 5.3 or something like that. It was, it was oh close to one and a half. And- I just thought of two more whenever you're done. Okay. And that person that, that, that was recorded for caused a wreck in, I think it was like Belgium or Norway or somewhere like It was in Europe and uh, they died. And so whenever they took their, their BAC, it was like hours after they died. And so like, it, it was probably even higher, but the time that they recorded it, that's how high it was. And that's the highest ever recorded. Oh but what's Lord. insane about that is that that person's tolerance was probably so high that that didn't even phase them. Yeah. Cause they were able to get out of their house drive on regular streets, get on the highway, and then cause the crash. Oh my lord. Yeah, uh, so I mean, I, I just, uh, so I was just wondering with what you were saying about your yeah. tolerance being yes. so high. Like, I, said, I don't know a single alcoholic at, that was in treatment that it wasn't like, yeah, my, my BAC never went below, um, you know. The legal limit. Point, yeah, ever below the legal limit. And I was just like, God, to be able to function on being drunk, like, that takes a lot. Yeah, it's and, like out of curiosity, it was a few times where like, I passed out at like 9, 8.30, 9 p.m. after drinking, I got off of work and I would check it just like out of curiosity at the house at like 7, 7.30 in the morning and I'd uh -huh. still be at like a 0.15. Yeah. 
Damn. After sleeping for like 12 hours. I, I blew a 0. 0.14 when I got my DUI. And I guess that, that leads me to me answering mine. I probably have to say driving drunk. Um, I, I've been drinking for 20 years. Well, well, no. I've been drinking since last August. So we'll just say I've been drinking for 20 or 19 years. Um, is it my... Because it's yeah, since last August. Sorry, anyways, I lost my train of thought. Um, but in all those years of driving drunk, I can't believe I only got one DUI. Because I remember one time driving home from the gay bars in St. Louis, I had to have one eye closed so I could focus on the road. Like I was scared for my freaking life, and I was like, I didn't even, I didn't even care about getting pulled over because I was like, that would be a relief. I was afraid of dying. You know, like, I was just like, I don't, I mean, of course, I was afraid of getting pulled over, but, like, my my main focus was make it home alive, and, you know, it's funny, I was thinking that, but I wasn't thinking about other people on the road. Granted, it was, like, three in the morning, and I was driving out to the suburbs from St. Louis, and so it's not like there were lots of people on the road going that way at that hour, but, um, yeah, I drove in the left lane like this, or I can't remember which I had open. But it was just, I remember times like when the road curved, I was like, right, gonna make these adjustments really slowly yeah, so I don't. Like, hold on to the like this. <laughs> so I was like, I'm gonna make it really slowly so I go, ah, instead of, ah! but, um, Yeah. Um, and then one time when I was using meth, this was in my early 20s, I um, met a guy in Chicago whenever I was there. I was supposed to be there hanging out with a friend, but I told her I couldn't make it, but instead I still went to Chicago and ended up using drugs and having sex with these guys all weekend. And then whenever it came time to come home, I wasn't ready for the party to be done, so I missed my bus going back to St. Louis and kept on partying at one of the places I, I went to. This guy was like, hey, I'm going to, um, um, what is it? Palm Springs in California. I'm going to Palm Springs over Christmas and New Year's, do you want to go with me? I just, like, he was literally inside me when he asked me. So it was just like, I, I felt like this connection with him, like I should go. Well, I mean, like, that was just, that was the dumbest thing I've ever done. I ended up, you know, I ended up fighting, like, by, like, day three, and we were going to be there for two weeks. Um, he ended up deciding to go to a different place than where we were staying, which was a clothing optional place. And he was like, I'm going to take you back to the airport. He's like, we're not, this isn't happening. And I was like, I'm going to stay. So I found somewhere to stay and I ended up getting sick. Like stomach bug times a bajillion. And it was due to me having used basically nonstop for two weeks. And then I got a simple stomach bug. But like, I've, I've never shit so much in my entire life. I couldn't keep anything in. Like it was, it was gross. It was terrible. I had no energy. Um, and it was, it was bad. Like, I, I don't know how close I was to having something bad happen to me, but we finally went to an urgent care and she, like, I didn't have insurance at that time. And the doctor just gave me something that helped stop the diarrhea. Um, but it was, it was bad. And I came back and my friends were like, holy crap, you look terrible. What happened to you? You know? And so it was just, I, I, who, who knows what would have happened there? Like, well, I know what could have happened because he made me check his luggage and his luggage had a huge bag of meth that was like this big. And um, if that had gotten searched, I would have been arrested for it because I checked it, even though it's clearly his stuff. It's not like none of my clothes, but um, he convinced me to check all the baggage because he had to go park the car and we needed to get on the plane. Um, so I could have very, I could very well have gone to prison for being a drug mule, an unwitting or an un, I didn't know about it at first. Unknowingly. Unknowingly. There we go. I was like, right, right, right. right. <laughs> um, real fast though. Like my number two after, um, I was up for probably about six days and I was driving and I, uh, I was having sleep deprivation hallucinations oh, shit. while driving. So like uh, there was cars behind me and to this day, I still don't know if they were real cars or not because at one point they were there and another point they were like disappeared and I was seeing like shadow people and like 
<sighs> and then okay, well, that's just you need some sleep <laughs> right like shadow people are scary y'all <laughs> um and then number three so like I am five foot three and I'm about like 150 maybe 160 and usually when I do coke like I'll drink and when I'm doing coke I can when I was doing coke I guess <laughs> right, I would usually drink about a fifth of tequila by myself yeah so, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I don't think we're going to make it through all these questions, but let me, let me we see. We can always make a part two. How much time is there? Yeah, we, we can't always make a part two. Four minutes left. Four we minutes left? We got ten. Yeah. Okay. Um, let me see. What's the worst thing that has happened to you because of your addiction? Mm. Loss of trust with a lot of people. And um, there's been a couple times where the word no was not always enough, if that makes sense. Yeah. Okay, sure. Uh, see, for me, it would probably be the damage I caused to my marriage and the loss of trust there and like that relationship become almost becoming non-existent, almost ending that relationship because of my use. But I'm trying to look on the positive side of that and think about how much better it can be now that we've reached that point and rebuilding into something better than it was to begin with. Um, anyways, the other thing would probably be the two DUIs that I have gotten from my use. Dealing with all legal troubles and having to spend like two years without a driver's license, having to bum ride, it's like I'm in high school again. I'm dead. <laughs> Sorry. So yeah, that's probably it. Okay. Mine would have to be um, basically losing the trust and respect of my entire family and friends. Um, I've lost friends. I've, for probably, I'd say for everyone that I've lost, I've gained more in sobriety, but um, it doesn't mean it didn't hurt any less whenever someone decides to cut you out of their life. Um, and I'd say most of the trust and respect of my family, my siblings do not like me. Um, and it's funny, if tomorrow is my mom's 70th birthday and they're all coming to town. My sister from Arkansas and my sister from um, um, California are coming and my brother lives here. So everyone's gonna be here. My Aunt Carol came and I have to basically spend the day with people who I know hate me and like, I am not looking forward to it. Because um, my parents tell me all the things that my siblings say about me. Um, I don't know if they say it to be hurtful or as a way of motivation. Um, but they tell me the things that my siblings do. And it really hurts. It hurts a lot. Besides being an addict, what is something you would change about yourself? <laughs> um it doesn't even have to be sobriety related if you want to be like i wish my hair was longer or you know i don't know i want bigger boobs <laughs> i don't know they're pretty juicy true well, but like things here <laughs> can always be bigger <laughs> all right um i would have to say probably like how isolating I am a lot of the time. Like I have like maybe well until meeting like you guys and meeting Drew and I probably have like one good friend. I haven't even talked to him in probably two months. Like I just I have a hard time making friends. I know a lot of that is my fault. I don't follow through with communication. I'm really bad about replying to text messages. I don't know if it's like a selfishness thing or laziness. I don't want to put the effort in. I don't know what that is, but like being a landmark for the first time in a long time where I've really like invested in other people's lives and like 
took the time to like get to know people and spent time actually trying to make friends and <gasps> talk about things other than myself. So yeah, that'd probably be it. Just trying to be more involved in other people's lives, I guess would be a short way to put it. Okay. Uh, for me, I would probably change my work ethic. Um, if I don't like doing something, I won't do it. Five minutes, okay. Um, and so I've lost a lot of jobs due to like not wanting to go into work. Um, as whether or not I was, I mean, even if I wasn't high, I was like, I don't feel like working today, I'm gonna call in. Um, so I just would like to have a better work ethic um, so I can be a successful, self-sufficient adult um, that doesn't have to rely on his parents for everything anymore, so. Okay, you guys are serious, I'm changing mine. I wanna be more creative, cre creativity. I wanna be more creative. <laughs> <laughs> more creativity <laughs> yes <laughs> and bigger boobs <laughs> oh so you're not gonna change yours yeah i want both <laughs> oh okay sorry i misunderstood that. i, I, I don't know you said one thing but like rules are made to be broken right <laughs> <laughs> that's why we got that's why we landed here <laughs> i'm gonna go ahead and end it there so we can just have a little you know, regular wrap talking up. without wrap up, I guess. Um, so thank you both for um, agreeing to do this with me. I really appreciate it. Um, it's great to see your freaking face, Kelsey. I know I got to see, <laughs> I got to see it the other day when we FaceTimed, but um, it was, um, I mostly, well, I think I mostly FaceTimed with Jason once you got in the car. I know, I had to drive. I was like, here, hold this. <laughs> but I will hopefully be seeing you soon. Oh yeah, for sure. Like, I mean, fingers crossed, God forbid, someone in my family become infected with COVID. So cross your fingers that that does not happen. Yeah, please don't. <laughs> so like, um, yeah, I'm so looking forward to this. Next What's that? I said, because I'm so looking forward to this. I know, me too. Uh, that's how you the, me move? Yeah, okay. I was about to ask. You're flying out here to help him out? Yes. Yeah, I feel bad. He was asking me for help, but my wife working on weekends and me having to be here with the kids and my yeah. work schedule just got changed, so I'm going to be working next Saturday. Yeah, I feel bad. I just got too much stuff going on. No, it's okay. I was just, yeah. like, basically, I was wanting, I just wanted to go with someone who was cool, who I'd have a Somebody good time, enjoy talking, to. enjoy talking to for 14 hours. Um, right? We can vlog, like... <laughs> <laughs> we could make a video of us in the car right like oh my god that's gonna be so fun <laughs> okay. um how much time do we have now yeah, two, two minutes. minutes two minutes all right do you guys have any final thoughts on on anything that we've said or anything you just feel like about sobriety um, um. go ahead <laughs> I just know that I mean it is an uphill battle but it is worth it one day at a time one step at a time and yeah. as long as it works if you work it and mm -hmm. as long as you stick to it you know you can do it what I feel like I've heard that before it works if you work it um probably <laughs> but yeah, just stick to it and we can all do this good support system we yeah. got this yeah what were you saying, Adam? I was going to say, I used to hate all those, like, little cliche things they say in AA. Like, whenever you actually get sober and you actually, like, apply the things that they say, you realize they're all true. It's like, oh, man. Yep. But, no, in closing, I mean, I'm just happy to be sober. I mean, like you said, it's an uphill battle, but when you realize that putting in the work makes you so much happier and makes your life worth living, it's, all, it's worth putting in the work. And, you know, it's like, like 40 million times in treatment if you put in half the amount of work towards getting sober as you did towards getting high and you're going to stay sober and that's so true because i feel like it's so much less tiring trying to stay sober than it was trying to stay fucked up 24 7 yeah for you. um for me i would just say um i'm happy i'm an addict because i've met some of the most awesome people um that i otherwise wouldn't have because the only thing that we generally have in common is that we're we have the same struggle 
So I've gotten to know some really awesome people from all kinds of walks of life that, mm -hmm. you know, just because you're a doctor doesn't mean you're not an addict. That's just because you're a lawyer doesn't mean that you don't struggle. You know, it's, it's, it's not just people who are down and out who suffer. It's, I guess. All right. Um, anyways, all right. I think it's about to stop recording. So, um, <laughs> bye everybody. Please like, share, and subscribe. Bye. Bye.